Shabbat Shalom again. Here we are. Time is flying. 2015. First day of unleavened bread. Also a Shabbat. Uh, the message I'm going to give today is called Is Yahweh Like You? Is Yahweh Like You? And I was thinking about it, you know, uh, in the world today, there's more than two million denominations all claiming to believe in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to be some form of Christianity, Messianic, whatever you want to call it. So many forms of heresy and problems uh, within uh, congregations. And I think they all stem from because people think that Yahweh is like them. And I think we all think it, right? We don't want to think Yahweh's not like us. So I want to give you a lot of food for thought today that I don't even think we should really be thinking in those terms, as we'll see. So let's start first in Isaiah 55, in verse 6. It says, Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the man of vanity his thoughts and let him return to Yahweh and he will have mercy on him and our Elohim for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says Yahweh. For as the heavens are high from the earth, so my ways are high from your ways, and my thoughts from your thoughts. So I think many times when we're making decisions, and think about it, yes, Scripture does have uh, right and wrong, it does have thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, but many times in Scripture, there aren't uh, absolutes like that. Like Yahweh gives us concepts like modesty. That he leads it up to us to decide according to his word, not according to ourselves. And the problem is, we all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different mindsets. And a lot of times, we're not leaving that mindset. You know, I, I see a lot in the Messianic movement that people come as far as they realize Sunday is wrong and they come into the Sabbath. Or this meat is wrong and they come into this meat. Uh, you know, or this day is pagan and they come into this. But they're not realizing their mindset is not the mindset of Yahweh. And then all of a sudden, they're thinking that Yahweh is thinking like them. So when they're making decisions on many things, you know, is this right or is this wrong? You know, is that right or is that wrong? Women wearing tassels, you know, that clearly is against Scripture. They're thinking Yahweh is like them. And that's the way they're justifying themselves. Because even as an elder comes and tells them they're wrong, they're saying, well, I don't follow a man. You know, I only follow Yahweh. So in essence, it's a big problem today because people think Yahweh's like that. So I really want to show that like Yahweh says here, he's not like any of us. You know, he's not like any of us. And the first, uh, like they say, the first road to recovery is admittance. So if we really want to change, as we'll get into later in the message, we have to realize the first thing is Yahweh is not like us. Because if he was like us, we wouldn't have to change. The reason we have to change is, is because he's not like us. But when we justify ourselves, and this is where self-righteousness comes from. Self-righteousness is the, 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 the ultimate person thinking Yahweh is like them. Because it doesn't matter that Yahweh didn't say this. I said it. And if I say it, then it's got to be right. Which is simply self-righteousness. It's putting a righteousness to scripture that Yahweh never put there. If we go to Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40 in verse 12, again he says, Who has measured in his hand the waters and the heavens by a span meted out, and enclosed in the measure the dust of the earth, and weighed in the balance the mountains and the hills and the scales? Who has meted out the spirit of Yahweh, or a man his counsel taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who trained him and taught him in the path of justice? And taught him knowledge and made known to him the way of discernment. Lo, nations are as a drop in a bucket, and a reckoned as dust of the scales. Lo, he takes up the coast as a small thing. So while Yahweh looking from the heavens at this little marble that we call earth, and all of us little ants, you know, seven or eight billion running around, we're all just a drop in a bucket. You know, like a little, little spit in a bucket is all we are. And like I said, we really, if we're really going to be like Yahweh, we have to understand that. We have to understand how high He is and how low we are. And I always said that uh, Yahweh is not uh, Elohim of vanity. He doesn't want us to worship Him and praise Him because He's sitting up there 
feeding it all in. He wants us to do that because it's the only way we'll humble ourselves. It's, and and it's, it's truth, you know. And if we're going to worship Him, Yahweh is spirit and we must worship Him in spirit and truth. The only way to worship Him is to realize how high He is and how low we are. And if we don't understand that concept, we'll never worship Him correctly. But prideful man, we put too much emphasis on ourselves, and we don't give the glory to Yahweh. You know? And like I always say, what is pride? Pride is simply a self-worth that's not there. You know, There is no self-worth to us except Him living in us. That's the only self-worth. And that's the only way we're going to change as we'll get into it in a little bit. Isaiah 44, a couple of chapters over. You know, very interesting scripture he goes into here. I'm going to start in verse 11. It's about a man who's building an idol. And he says, Behold, all his companions shall be ashamed. And the craftsmen, they are all from men. They shall assemble, all of them shall stand. They shall dread. They shall be ashamed together. He carves iron with a cutting tool. He works in the coals and forms it with hammers and works it with a powerful arm. Then he is hungry and he has no strength. He drinks no water and is weary. So he's saying, here's this guy doing all this hard work to make this idol. And then he's so tired, he didn't even uh, have food to eat. The carpenter fashions the wood. He stretches a line. He marks it with a chisel. He shapes it with a carving tool. He marks it with a compass. And he makes it according to the figure of a man, as the beauty of a man, to sit in the house. He cuts down cedars and takes cypress and oak. And he makes the trees of the forest strong for him. He plants a tree and rain makes it grow. And it shall be for a man to burn. Yea, he takes of them and is warmed, and he kindles it and bakes bread. Yea, he makes a god and worships. He makes a carved image and bows to it. He burns half of it in the fire. He eats flesh on half of it. He roasts, he roasts, roasts, and is satisfied. Then he warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And he makes a god of the rest and his carved image. He bows to it and worships and prays and says, Deliver me, for you are my echo. They do not know nor discern, for he has smeared their eyes from seeing, their hearts from understanding. And no one turns back to his heart, nor has knowledge nor discernment to say, I have burned half in the fire, and I baked bread on the coals. I have roasted flesh, and have eaten it, and I have made the rest of it into an idol. Shall I bow to a product of a tree? Feeding on ashes, a deceived heart turns him aside, and he does not deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? I love this story because it really is prophetic of human beings. You know, that we take something that Yahweh created, the tree. We cut this tree down and half of it he's, he's cutting up and burning for wood to eat. And then half of it he's carving out himself into this idol and he's bowing down to it. And Yahweh's saying, what vanity is this? What vanity is this? And how much do we do the same thing? You know, we idolize the things we make. We idolize the things we do. You know, we idolize anything that comes from us. You know, anything that's an extension of us. And that's why we, we, we love our children and our grandchildren and anything that's an extension of us. Why? Because we love ourselves, And that's the problem. You know, that a lot of times we're loving ourselves more than we're loving Yahweh. And then in our, in, in our, in our pride and in our self-righteousness, we're justifying ourselves because we're saying Yahweh is like us. You know? So, oh, I'm not like this guy out there because I'm like Yahweh. Well, maybe not so fast. Maybe we're not as much like Yahweh as we think, as he says. You know, How can we understand? Like he said to Job, were you there when I created the world? Were you there when I put the stars in the heaven? We can't even begin to think what Yahweh is like. You know, And his ways are so much higher than our ways, and his thoughts are thoughts. Jeremiah 23, because then prideful man goes to the next step. Then they're going to start telling you, they're going to start speaking for Yahweh. They're going to tell you how Yahweh feels. They're going to tell you Yahweh's feelings. They're going to tell you words from Yahweh. You know? I had a man telling me uh, recently, this guy who uh, thinks he's a prophet. He's a false prophet from the United States. Of course, that's where 95% come from Babylon. And I told him, I said, you can't be a prophet. Number one, you made prophecies that you said were from Yahweh and he used God. That never came true. Does Yahweh ever fail? Of course not. That's what Yahweh says in his word. This is the way you prove it. If it doesn't happen, he's a false prophet. And number two, he prophesied firsthand. Thus saith God. Yahweh's name isn't God. Yahweh never used that name. That's the name of a pagan deity. And we're going to see. Yahweh says, I'm not going to give my glory. And then the person tried to say, he tried to judge me 
Because I said he couldn't be a prophet because he's prophesying in the false name. I never spoke in the first person of Yahweh. I don't sit here and go in a trance and say this is Yahweh speaking. I do believe Yahweh speaks through me, inspires the words from his word. But I've never said that my word spoke that I, Yahweh, says this. And many times I've had people send me things like that. Writing as if they're like a prophet, like Jeremiah or Isaiah. And the law and the prophets were until John. What does that mean? It means today, not that there aren't New Testament prophets, but those are prophets that are discerning Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. They're not people writing down new books. We're not going to go to turn the first on, you know, and it's going to say, I, Yahweh, says this. Yahweh's not working that way anymore, because now we have his spirit, and his spirit is helping us to discern what he already wrote. And until we can discern all this, what will take us a lifetime, we don't have to write new books. But I'm going to read you now of people, many people out there, in Christianity today, Messianics, that are saying this. They're saying in the first sentence, prophecies. You can go on the internet all over the place and look for prophecies of people talking in the first person, using Yahweh, using God, using all kinds of names, you know. And Yahweh is against it. Jeremiah 23 and verse 16. He judged the cause of the poor. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Let me start here. I'm in verse 22. Chapter 22. Jeremiah 23, verse 16. So says Yahweh of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophet who prophesied to you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, not out of the mouth of Yahweh. They say to those who despise me, Yahweh has said, you shall have peace. And they say to everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, evil shall not come upon you. You know, where do you ever hear of Babylon about repentance? Where do you hear about sin? Oh no, you know, everything will be fine, everything will be good. For who has stood in the counsel of Yahweh and has seen and heard his word? Who has listened to his word and heard? Behold, the whirlwind of Yahweh has gone forth in fury, even a whirling storm. It will whirl on the head of the wicked. The anger of Yahweh shall not turn back until he has executed and until he has set up the purposes of his heart. In the latter days, you'll understand it perfectly. So this isn't something that's from 3,500 years ago. This is something that applies to us today. I have not sent the prophets... Yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Just had a blood moon, right? How many books, how many videos, how many things going out on the blood moons from the so-called prophets? But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. We need to hear a little bit less about the blood moons and a little bit more about repentance. You know? Write a book about repentance, not another book about the blood moons. Selling them and trying to get them. If we drop down to verse 25, I have heard what the prophets said. Those who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Hear it all the time. How long is there in the heart of the prophets the prophet of lies? Yea, the prophets of the deceit of their own heart. They plot to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell, each one to his neighbor, even as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The Lord said this, the Lord said that. What does the Lord mean, Baal? And how many times have you talked to a person about the name of Yahweh? And how many times have you got the answer? But I prayed in the name of Jesus and I was healed. Right? You hear this? You hear these things. What does he say here? They plot to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell each to the neighbors, even as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Now, I'm not saying Yahweh in his mercy can't heal somebody if they don't know his name. But what I'm saying here is, it's not going to change the name of Yahweh. His name doesn't change because Yahweh is merciful. But I can tell you this much, probably at least 80% of the time they're lying. Especially when they're prophesying. Because Yahweh doesn't prophesy in the name of God or Jesus or any other name. He prophesies in his own name. We have how many examples here? At least 7,000 just in the Old Testament. So Yahweh doesn't have to prophesy in the name of a false deity just because the person doesn't know his name. But there's a lot of false prophets out there. And there's times, there's stories that I've heard that I said, well, this just doesn't make sense. This person doesn't seem like a liar. And yet they're saying this and, and, and they're using the wrong name. And in the end, they found out they were a liar. You find out they did lie. You find out they made it up. And then they had to admit it when they got caught. So, is Yahweh like you? He certainly ain't like them. He's not like the false prophets that are trying to convince people of the wrong name by their false dreams and their false visions. 
Not the way Yahweh works. The prophet who has a dream, one of my favorite scriptures, let him tell the dream. He who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What does the chaff to do with the wheat, says Yahweh? And I've said this to people many, many times, you know. I'm not saying people can't have dreams. I've had dreams. Some of you may have had dreams. They might be interesting. Sometimes they can even have meaning. But he who has a dream, let him tell the dream. He who has my word, let him speak it faithfully. And I'd much rather sit here and expound the word of Yahweh to you than tell you my dream. Because who knows what my dream may mean or may not mean. But I could surely tell you what the word of Yahweh means because it interprets itself. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. And what we're doing today, we're going to go from scripture to scripture and put it all together. Is not my word like fire, says Yahweh, and like a hammer which breaks a rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, says Yahweh, I am against the prophets who steal my words, each one from his neighbor. They take the word of Yahweh, they twist and they turn it for their own gain. And Yahweh is saying he is against them. Yahweh says, behold, I am against the prophets who use their tongues and says, he says. And we could think, right? Going years back when we were in Israel, how many times we met some of these prophets. And that's what, exactly what they said. He said, you know, they come, he said to me today, he said this, you know, Yahweh is crying, Yahweh is upset, Yahweh is this. They know all the feelings of Yahweh. And he says, stop it. Stop it. You're not like me. You're not like me. Yahweh says, Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams and tell them and cause my people to go astray by their lies and by their foolishness. And it is. Most of it is foolishness. Yet I did not send them nor command them, and they will not profit this people at all, says Yahweh. And when this people, or the prophet or the priest, shall ask, saying, What is the utterance of Yahweh? You shall then say to them, What utterance? You know, when they come up and they're telling you these dreams, what utterance? What are they talking about? I will even abandon you, says Yahweh. And the prophet and the priest and the people who will say the utterance of Yahweh, I will even punish that man in his house. And you shall say each one to his neighbor and each one to his brother, what has Yahweh answered and what has Yahweh spoken? And you shall not mention the utterance of Yahweh again, for each man's word shall be his burden. Remember, whatever comes out of your mouth, justified by your words or condemned by your words. But you have perverted the words of the living Elohim, Yahweh of hosts, our Elohim. So you shall say to the prophet, what has Yahweh answered you? And what has Yahweh spoken? And if you say the utterance of Yahweh, therefore so says Yahweh, because you say this word, the utterance of Yahweh, and I have sent you saying, you shall not say the utterance of Yahweh, therefore behold, I even I will utterly forget you and cast you off in the city I have given to you and your fathers away from my face. And I will put on you a never ending, ne a, a, an everlasting reproach and never ending disgrace on you, which shall not be forgotten. So Yahweh is pretty serious here. And this isn't something, you know, that, that we're talking about one or two people. We're talking about a movement throughout the world today of false prophets. You know, false prophets going around. And they think that Yahweh is like them. That's why they're doing it. Because they think that Yahweh is speaking through them. And he clearly says he's not. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. On the same subject for a minute. Because it's not just the First Testament. 2 Peter 3, but false prophets were among the people, as also false teachers will be among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and denying the master who has bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves, the oneness doctrine. Yeshua doesn't exist. Yeshua and the Father are the same. And many will follow their destructive ways, by whom the way of truth will be evil spoken of. And when you come and you stand firm on the truth, they'll speak evil of you. And by covetedness, with well-turned words, they'll use you for gain, for whom judgment from the very beginning has not ceased, and their destruction is always active. And we know it. It's a money market. It's, it's a big money market business, and that's why they're doing it. We drop down to verse 10. And especially he will punish those who follow after the filthy lusts of the flesh, and have no respect for authority. Self-willed and arrogant they are, and they do not tremble when they blaspheme. Where cherubs being greater in strength and power do not bring against them the condemnation and blasphemy. But these men, like the dumb beasts, which by nature are for slaughter and destruction, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption. The ones I'll never follow a man. They're against judicial order, against Yahweh. And why are they doing it? Because they think Yahweh is like them. But Yahweh is not like them. They think that Yahweh is like them. And sometimes if we think that Yahweh is like us, 
we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble and maybe even lose our salvation. Because many of these people, they're not serving the body of Messiah. They're not surrendering to Yahweh. They're serving themselves. But they're thinking Yahweh's like them. I want to go to example in the first covenant in number 16 of a group of people who thought exactly like this. People who actually lost their salvation because they thought Yahweh was like them. Number 16, <clears throat> starting in verse 1, I'll only read parts of the chapter. And Korah the son of Ishar, the son of Kohat, the son of Levi, took also Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab, and On the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the sons of Israel, 250 rulers of the congregation. Rulers now, so these are, you got a lot of people here. Elect men of the assembly, men of name. So these were tri tribal leaders. These weren't just people in the audience. And they were assembled against Moses and against Aaron. And they said to him, you take too much. For all the congregation, all of them are holy. And Yahweh is among them. Why then do you lift yourself above the assembly of Yahweh? And Moses heard and fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, In the morning Yahweh will know who are his, and who is holy, and who shall cause him to come near to him. Even him whom he may choose... He will cause to come near to him. So, just like I'm talking about, this is the problem. The problem is that these people are just rebellious and they want to come against Moses. The problem is they think Yahweh is like them. They're thinking, who is this guy? Who is this guy? You know? You're, you're just a man. You come here. You know, you're thinking you're better than we are. And yet, Yahweh set that man up. Yahweh set Moses up. So, now you're in a, you're in a, a quadrum here. Because Moses is saying, well, Yahweh is speaking through me, and these guys are saying, no, Yahweh's speaking through us. And we're going to see the result. If we go down to verse 8, And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it too little a thing for you that the Elohim of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle, and to stand before the congregation to minister to him? Remember, the Levites were servants. They weren't priests, but they were servants, but they were set apart in the tabernacle. Yea, he has brought you near, and all your brothers, the sons of Levi. And you, will you seek the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company that have gathered against Yahweh. What is Aaron? Do you murmur against him? See, and that's the danger of thinking Yahweh is like us. Because we get this thought in our mind, and we go out and we do things thinking we're doing the will of Yahweh. And actually we're doing the very opposite. We're doing the opposite of the will of Yahweh. And we're fighting against the will of Yahweh. And we're bringing destruction on ourselves. And what's the end result? Drop down to verse 28. And Moses said, By this you shall know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these works, and that not from my own heart. If these die, talking about the rebellious ones, core in them, according to the death of all men, and are visited according to the visit visitation of all men, then Yahweh has not sent me. And if Yahweh makes a new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them, and all that they have, and they go down into Sheol, then you will know that these men have despised Yahweh. And it happened... As he made an end to speaking all these words, the ground split from under them and split apart. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them in their houses and all the men who were for Korah and their possessions. And they went down, they and all who they had alive to Sheol, and the earth covered over them. And they perished from the midst of the assembly, and all Israel who was around them fled at their cry, and they said, Let the earth swallow us up. And the fire came forth from Yahweh and consumed the 250 men that offered the incense. Now, Think about it. Now, if you're there and you see this, if you had any doubts before, is he working through Moses or is he working through these guys? You would think at this point all those doubts would be done. But yet there were still a lot of people that thought Yahweh was like them. So let's look at what happens next. Verse 41. And all the congregation of the sons of Israel murmured on the next day against Moses and against Aaron, saying, you've killed the people of Yahweh. They still didn't get it. I've had people say that to me. I've had people that were so evil and so wicked. And it doesn't happen very often, but you have to put them out of the congregation. You know? And even when people know what they did, I've had people that have complained. And you really have to think, is, is Yahweh like you? Is Yahweh like you? If you love evilness, if you can sit around evilness, if you know that somebody is living in adultery, or somebody is doing some kind of sin... And you're against that person being put away from the assembly. You are not like Yahweh. You're like these people here. You're the people that are supporting the evil. And that's what we have to think about. Are we like Yahweh? 
Are we like Yahweh? Verse 41, like we said. And the people murmured against Moses. Moses didn't open up the ground. Yahweh opened up the ground. That's what he said. You're not murmuring against Aaron. You're murmuring against Yahweh. So here it is. These people are so perverted, just like Satan, that they're thinking they're like Yahweh. And they're about as far as you can get from Yahweh as it is. And it happened as the company was called together against Moses, against Aaron, that they turned toward the tent of meeting. And behold, the cloud had covered it, and the glory of Yahweh appeared. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from the midst of this company, and I shall consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. And now you'll see who's like Yahweh. And Moses said to Aaron, Take the fire pan and put fire in it from the altar, and lay on incense, and go hurry to the congregation and atone for them. For the wrath has gone out from the presence of Yahweh, the plague has begun. So here it is, Moses didn't say, ha ha, good, let me get revenge, let them all die. No, he was like Yahweh, he, he looked for mercy, he looked for pity, and he realized they don't know what they're doing here. And he sends Aaron to intercede and atone for them. And Aaron did as Moses had spoken and ran to the midst of the assembly, and behold, the plague had begun among the people. And he laid on the incense and atoned for the people, and stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. And those who died by the plague were 14,000. And 700 beside those who died in the matter of Korah. So just think about it. Because if you don't think like Yahweh, what's going to happen? In the end of the day, they don't see Yahweh, but they see Moses and Aaron. What are they thinking? They killed all these people. Just like they said. Why would they say, why did you bring us out to this wilderness to kill us? Because they weren't thinking like Yahweh. And it's going to happen in the end time, you know. Because things will happen in the end time. Even like I said, most people don't believe America is Babylon. Even when Babylon falls, they're not going to believe it. They'll have another reason why it fell. Because they think Yahweh is like them. But Yahweh isn't like them. And that's why I hope you're seeing as we go along why it's so important to have the mind of Yahweh. Because like I was saying, it's the only truth that's truth. You know? And you've got to surrender yourself. You have to believe it at face value. And where you're wrong, you've got to repent and you've got to change. But if you're prideful and you won't and you stay on that hard spot, you're going to end up just like this. You're going to end up like these people who wound up losing their eternal life. Next point I want to go over is Jacob 3. Jacob, the third chapter. Because, you know, we know that life is in the tongue, in the words of the tongue, and when you think about it, there is no greater power that you have than your tongue. You know, that we have the ability that Yahweh has given us, not only to speak, but we don't speak like a robot. Like, it's not like you press a button and you have ten things you can say. Mama, Papa, get me water. No, we have a mind that Yahweh allows us to take millions of words and concepts and phrases and put them all together with His Spirit and let words of life come out. He gives us the ability on our own, not from road, not from, from just repetition, to praise Him. Yes, Yahweh, we love you. No, but to think about how we love Him. To think of everything He does for us. And just let words come flowing out through His Spirit of praise and glory and honor to Him and to each other. And yet, how does mankind use that wonderful gift? Let's read it. Chapter 3 of Jacob. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, this one is a mature man, also able to subdue the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the mouth of the horses for them to obey us, and we turn about their whole body. We know that the way you pull a horse. Behold, the ships also, being so great and being driven by violent winds, they are directed by a very small rudder wherever the one steering wishes. So also the tongue is a little member and most great things. Behold how a little fire sets a blade large forest. Now the tongue is a fire, and the world of sin is like a forest. And this very tongue, while it is among your members, can defile our whole body. Can you imagine? That tiny little, you know, piece of flesh there can defile your whole body. And rolls down like a wheel and sets on fire the course of our entire life. And in the end, is it, it is consumed by fire. And every species of beast Beasts, both indeed of birds and creeping things, and of sea animals, is tamed, and has been tamed by the will of man. But no one of man is able to tame the tongue. It is an unrestrainable evil, full of death-dealing poison. 
But this we bless Yahweh, even the Father, and by this we curse men, having come into being according to the image of Elohim. Out of the same mouth comes forth blessing and cursing. My brothers, it is not fitting that these things be so. Does the fountain out of the same hole send forth the sweet and the bitter? My brothers, if fig tree is not able to produce olives or a vine figs, so neither can a fountain produce both salt and sweet water. Who is wise in knowing among you? Let him prove his works by his good behavior in meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and contention in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This is not the wisdom coming down from above, but this is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where jealousy and contention are, there is confusion in every foul deed. But the wisdom from above is firstly truly perfect and peaceable, gentle, obedient, full of mercy and good fruits, not partial and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace for the ones making peace. If we go to the next chapter, just verse 11 and 12. Do not speak against one another, brothers, for he who speaks against a brother and is judging a brother, he speaks against the Torah and judges the Torah. But if you judge the Torah, you are not a doer of the Torah by the judge. For there is one lawgiver who is able to save in the story. Who are you who judges your neighbor? So here it is, like I said, Yahweh gives us a tongue. He gives us a mind to be able to bring encouragement, to bring love, to bring praise and glory. And what does man use it for? They use it for gossip. They use it for malign. They use it for putting people down. And then they say they're like Yahweh. They want to think they're like Yahweh. The self-righteousness. That, oh, 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 oh. His, you know, tassel is an inch shorter than mine. <laughs> I would never do that. Did you, could you believe so-and-so had a mixed tie on? Oh, oh, oh. I'd never wear a mixed tie. <laughs> I'm just like Yahweh. And Yahweh sits there and is disgusted by it. He's disgusted by it. Because like I said, all of us are in the same boat. All of us are here and he's up there. And when we get this self-righteousness, when we get this, this, uh, this spirit of, of maligning, the spirit of gossip, when we use the, one of the greatest gifts he's given us, the gift of our mind and our tongue together for evil instead of good, we're not being like Yahweh. You know who we're being like? Revelation 12. I'll tell you who, you who you're like when you do that. Revelation 12, in verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent being called the devil and Satan. He deceiving the whole inhabitable world. Like we said, because everybody thinks Yahweh is like them. They're all deceived. But you don't have to be. And he was cast unto the earth, and his cherubs were cast out with him. Or his messengers. And I heard a great voice in heaven which said, Now has come salvation, the power and the kingdom of our Elohim, and the dominion of his Messiah. Because the accuser of our brethren is cast out, the one who accuses them day and night before Elohim. You know, and I've had people before come up to me with maligning to a brother or a sister in a certain way. And I'll ask them, I'll say, Well, did you go up to the person? Did you share it with them? Did you tell them? Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. Hmm, that doesn't make sense. So you won't go up to the person and share with them what they may be doing wrong, indiscreetly, without even knowing it, but you'd certainly go around and tell everybody else what they're doing wrong. Is Yahweh like you? Is Yahweh like you? Because when you do that, like I said, you have put yourself not only in Satan's army, you become his general. You become his general when you take a spirit of maligning and gossip. And like the scripture says here, you know, when we speak against a brother or sister, we're speaking against the Torah. And it doesn't mean, you know, that, 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 that there's not a process. There's a way. If someone's in error, knowing or unknowing, you go to the person. You go to the person. You try to restore them in love. It's not, though, that you just want to tell everybody else behind their back what they're doing that you would never do. And they say, one way to know if you have the spirit of self-righteousness is if the words ever come out of your mouth, oh, I would never do that. That is clear cut. If, they, if you say that, you know, he did what? Oh, I'd never do that. Even though you may never do that, if those words come out, you're self-righteous. Because don't be too sure you may never do that. You know, because you never know things you may do until you're in those situations. And what may happen in those situations. But again, we're not to compare each other to each other. We're to compare each other to the Messiah. So when I look at myself to Yeshua, wow, my mouth shuts pretty quick. So it doesn't make a difference how I'm compared to this one or that one. Like the Bible says, that's not wise. You know, what matters is how do I compare to my Messiah?
Am I living up to it? Numbers 23 and verse 19 says, El is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should repent. He has said and shall he has said, and shall he not do it? And he has spoken, and shall he not make it good? See, Yahweh never has to repent or lie, because Yahweh is always faithful to the truth. Yahweh is always faithful to the truth. Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes 5. It says, Guard your feet when you go to the house of the Elohim, and draw near to here, more than to give a sacrifice, as do the fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. <clears throat> See, they think all they have to do is give the sacrifice, and that's great. I've seen people that have been blessed by Yahweh financially. And they think by just throwing money around, that's going to cover all their sins. I had a man actually tell me that, who, who, who had a problem with adultery. And he said, but all the money I'm giving and helping, doesn't that equal out? It's like, wow, what do you think Yahweh is? What on earth do you think Yahweh is? He, any money we have, he gave us anyway. And we're going to give him back the money he gave us so that we can go out and justify adultery or any other sin? Of course not. Do not be hasty with your mouth and do not let your heart hurry to bring forth a word before the Elohim. For the Elohim is in heaven, and you are on earth. On account of this, let your words be few. Like I said, he is so far above what we are. You know, so far above. For the dream comes through the greatness of the task, and the voice of the fool is known by his many words. When you vow a vow to Elohim, do not wait to fulfill it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill that which you have vowed. It is better you should not vow then you should vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Do not say before the messenger of Yahweh that it was an error. Why should the Elohim be angry over your voice and destroy the work of your hand? And in the world we're living in, one of the problems is we just have too many words. And the proverb says that where many words are, sin is not absent. And we really, we're not thinking enough. Because with the Holy Spirit, we should be giving the Holy Spirit time to put in our mind what we should say. Instead of just quickly, quickly, quickly always coming out with words and then always having to take them back. But very clearly, like he says, guard your feet when you go to the house of Elohim. We want to make sure we're not allowing our mouth to course our flesh to sin. Matthew 19, Matthew 19, 16 and 17. Matthew 19, 16 and 17. And behold, coming near one said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one Yahweh. But if you desire to enter into life, keep the commandments. So while even Yeshua, while he put his divinity <coughs> aside and he came here in the flesh, said, No one is good but Yahweh. And yet we want to think a lot of times we're good and we're not. We don't want to recognize our state, but if we go to Romans 3, we clearly, clearly see it. And this is why we don't judge each other to each other, because we're all in the same state. We're all in the state of a fallen nature. <clears throat> Romans 3 and verse 10. <clears throat> According as it has been written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is not one understanding, there is not one seeking Yahweh. All turned together, they became worthless together. Not one is doing goodness, not so much as one. Their throat is a tomb being opened. They use deceit with their tongues, the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery are in their way, and they did not know a way of peace. <clears throat> there is no fear of Elohim before their eyes, which is a big problem. Because the people who think that Yahweh is like them, when Yahweh is abhorring what they're doing, have no fear of Yahweh. And verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of Yahweh. So all of us are in this state. And this is the state, this is called repentance. This is the state that brings us to Yahweh. So it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. We don't want to stay in the state, as we're going to get into here in a couple minutes. But this is the state you have to get to if you really want to change. You have to get to this state that he's talking about. Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Because many things we're seeing where clearly Yahweh is not like us. There's many people you meet that will tell you the name of Yahweh doesn't matter. You could call him anything. <laughs> Some of them even pastors. Yahweh's not like that. Because Yahweh says, my name is Yahweh. 
You know, that is my name for all generations. I will not give my glory to graven images. That's what Yahweh says. And for man to come and override that, the creator of the universe, and say, no, it doesn't matter. Who do we think we are? When we speak for Yahweh, when it's not from his word. Now, we should speak for Yahweh, but it's out of the word. And that's why sometimes, if you go up to somebody that's living in adultery, and you show them the scripture, and they say, don't judge me, you're not judging them. You know, like Yeshua said, the words of this book. You're going out of love. Because you know that if someone is living in adultery and they don't repent, they're going to go to the lake of fire. So you go in humility, lest, you know, you can get puffed up and fall too. But it doesn't mean we don't approach each other where we have to, when somebody is living in sin. But let the Word do the judging, not each other. Let the Word do the judging. Let it come from Yahweh. Psalm 50 and verse 7. <clears throat> Hear my people and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am Elohim, your Elohim. Drop down to verse 12. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in the fullness of it. <laughs> you know, Yahweh doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't have to inform us of what's going on. Verse 16. But to the wicked, Elohim says, What is it to you to proclaim my statutes and to take up my covenant on your mouth? And you hate discipline, and you toss my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you were pleased with him, and with adulteress is your part. You give your mouth to evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You give fault to the son of your mother. You have done these things and, and I have kept silence. Remember what we said? That why does Yahweh sometimes not immediately judge us? Because he has all the time in the world. And he's not accepting what we're doing. He's giving us time to repent. But the evil person that's thinking Yahweh is like them, they're thinking his silence is giving credence to what they're doing. But look what he says. You've done these things and I've kept silence. You thought that surely I would be like you. But I will rebuke you and set in order before your eyes. So very clearly, Yahweh is not like them. Yahweh is not like the people that are doing these things. You know, Yahweh is not like the people that are out on their own, doing their own things, fighting against him, sinning, accepting sin in the congregation. Yahweh is not like so how do we become like Yahweh then? If we go to Genesis 26, or 126, Genesis 126. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the heaven, and the cattle, and the earth, and over the creepers creeping on the earth. And Elohim created the man in his own image, in the image of Elohim he created him. He created the male. So like we said, Yahweh said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. And then it says he created him in his image. Why is that? Because we can look like Yahweh as far as Yahweh has eyes, Yahweh has ears, Yahweh has a nose, Yahweh has a mouth. He says that in scripture. But to be able to be in his likeness is to be his character. That's not something that he can just puff on us. That's something that we have to grow into. That's something that, that takes time. That's something because we have free will that you have to surrender to the will of the Holy Spirit to do that. So, like I said in the beginning, the question, is Yahweh like you, is off right from the beginning. Because it says Yahweh made us in His image, but we have to grow into His likeness. And what did man do? Man has created Elohim in His image. So that's why people think Yahweh is like them, because they've created an Elohim that's not the Elohim in the Bible. And that's what we said, you know, if you're divorced and you want to remarry, even though the scripture says you have a living spouse, it's adultery, you come up with an Elohim that's so merciful that he doesn't want you living alone. Yahweh would never want me living alone. And then you get divorced again and divorced again and the same thing, you know. So you create an Elohim in your image that accepts whatever your vice is, you know. And that's the reason why people think Yahweh is like you. So the question isn't, is Yahweh like me? The question is, am I like Yahweh? And you get a whole different answer. So the question really isn't, is Yahweh like me? The question is, am I like Yahweh? So that's what I want to go into now. How can then we be like Yahweh? Because Yahweh shouldn't be like us. <laughs> we're, we're, we already saw in the first part of the sermon what we are. 
We're full and we have a full of nature. Yahweh shouldn't be like us, but we certainly should change and be like Yahweh. Let's go to Galatians 5. Because if we want to be like Yahweh, we don't have to do it through telling people dreams we had or saying that Yahweh is speaking through us in the first person. No, if you want to be like Yahweh, let's look how you can be like Yahweh. Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such things there is no instruction. But the ones belonging to Messiah crucified the flesh with his passions and lusts. Let us therefore live by the Spirit and surrender to the Spirit. Let us not be a vain glory that ridicules one another and envies one another. See, it's pride that's going to lift us up, making us think we're something when we're not, making us think that Yahweh's working with us in a way that He's not working with anybody. And really, we need to humble ourselves. We need to humble ourselves and focus on these nine fruits, and then you will be like Yahweh. Because this is His character. This is His character. I'd like to very briefly go into each one. First one being love, the binding tie of who Yahweh is. 1 John 4. 1 John 4 and verse 4. Little children, you are of Elohim and have overcome them, because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And as we'll see here in a minute or two, that it's the Spirit of Yahweh that transforms us, that what a miracle that Yahweh is doing, how can we be like him? He's going to take his mind, his thought pattern of all these nine fruits, and he's going to put it in our life, in, in, in our spirit, if we allow him to. He that is in you is greater than he in the world. They are of the world, because this, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. So we've got to make a difference. Do you want to be like the world, or do you want to be like Yahweh? We are of Elohim, the one knowing Elohim hears us. Whoever is not of Elohim does not hear us. From this we know the spirit of truth, and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another... Because love is of Yahweh, and everyone who loves has been generated from Elohim and knows Elohim. The one who does not love is not known Elohim, because Yahweh is love. And that's the problem when you see the people, the false people that think that Yahweh is like them. You don't see any love. The false prophets that are just judging and condemning and everyone's going to hell, you don't see any love of Yahweh coming to these people. The people that separate themselves from the congregation... Because I'm, it's between me and Yahweh. I'm not having anyone over me. Who are you serving? Is that love? Yeah. If I'm by myself, that's not love. That's why there has to be Yahweh and Yeshua. The greatest scripture, one of the greatest, John 3.16, For Yahweh so loved the world, He gave His only Son. There has to be two to love. And for a lot of these people thinking Yahweh is like them, it's only them. So they might say it's only me and Yahweh, but Yahweh saying, no, it's you and you. You're alone out there because I'm not like you. And if we want to be like him, the very first thing is this, this concept of love. Unconditional love, even like Moses, even when somebody hurts us, we don't get back railing for, for railing, but we have pity and we have mercy and we have love. By this we know the love of Elohim toward, towards us made known because Yahweh has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live by him. In this is love, not that we loved Yahweh, but that he loved us, right? It's not that, is Yahweh like me, but it is, am I like Yahweh? See, he loved us first because we didn't even know we loved this. In this world, man's love is only pride most of the time and selfishness. But Yahweh's love is true agape. It's true unconditional love. And he sent his son to be the atonement for our sins. Beloved, if Yahweh so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen Yahweh the Father at any time. If we love one another, Elohim abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because of the Spirit that He's given us. So like I said, that's the binding tie. Yahweh is love. It's what He's made up. His Spirit is a Spirit of love. It's outgoing concern for others. And if we love others, we're never going to backbite them, or malign them, or talk bad about them. We're going to try to help them because of our concern for them. Second one is joy, which is full of cheerfulness, to be full of cheerfulness. So again, if our life is depression... If we're always, woe is me, if everything is just new world order, if it's always how bad the world is, then we're not filled with cheer. Because even though it's a reality we have to live with, we know Yeshua said, I came to give life and give it more abundantly. 
If we look that without joy in your life, what will lead to it will lead to murmuring. And it's the, one of the main things that kept the Israelites out of the kingdom. So in any situation, you can be joyful. Because it doesn't matter what the situation is, you can find blessings in any situation. No matter how bad it is. We have great examples in the Bible of King David, of Joseph being in prison. That guys, they kept their focus and they were always joyful. That's why I really like Joseph and I really like uh, Daniel. You know? Because these are guys that you really never see them depressed and they were in some horrible situations as young men being taken captive out of the promised land, both of them. You know, being under pagan kings and yet they were very, very positive and joyful. In all things, and Yahweh blessed them for it. Peace, which is the absence of war, and strife, calmness of soul, you know, and of course, faith brings peace. So do you have peace in your life? Do you have peace in your life, or is there always strife? Is there always friction? Patience. Patience, which is fortitude, endurance. You know, because without patience, we get ourselves in trouble a lot. And the, think about our human nature, our fallen human nature without patience, how quick we'll jump to conclusions, how quick we'll make the wrong decisions, how many times we'll do the wrong things. But with patience, like Yahweh has, it helps us not to prejudge somebody, it helps us to forgive somebody when you're being wrong. It really keeps you out of a lot of trouble to have patience. The music is uh, adding to the Atmosphere. Kindness, which is moral excellence. Compassion. You know, one of Yahweh's great characteristics is kindness. You know, or do we just, when someone does something wrong, even if they really did it, we just are ready to just pounce on them and I can't believe he did this. You know, or do we have kindness? Moral excellence, always keeping above and compassion. Really having compassion, trying to understand maybe why somebody did something wrong in helping them. Goodness, which is having proper virtue and a mindset for actions. Because think about it, all of us make decisions like we say every day of our life, but by having goodness, having the proper virtue, we're doing it for the right reasons. And how many people that don't have goodness you know, will make all the wrong decisions? And when you have virtue, you'll never compromise on the word of Yahweh. So many times, I would say probably at least 30% of the, the questions that either through the website or people writing in have to do with virtue. You know, they have to do with a moral issue that even though if you really think about it, you can come to the right decision, but the Bible doesn't exactly say it. You know, do you think it's wrong to smoke cigarettes? You know, the Bible doesn't say it, but you can clearly put scriptures together showing why you wouldn't ever want to smoke cigarettes. So it's having proper virtue and a mindset for action. Faith, we've talked about that many times, which is simply conviction, belief, full belief in Yahweh, and full assurance without ever wavering. And how great that is, how much that helps. Because the, you know, in, in Hebrews eleven six, those who come to Yahweh must believe He is, and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So there's no way you could be like Yahweh if you don't 100% even believe He is. And believe it or not, not a lot, but way more than once or twice that I've had people that I've counseled that in the counseling they've actually said to be honest I don't even really 100% know if Yahweh even exists and they were honest enough to say it but wow you know and maybe there's a lot more people that actually may think that in the back of their mind and just aren't saying it but you have to have faith you have to have that full assurance because like Yahweh says how on earth can you expect anything if you don't even 100% believe that he exists Meekness, which is the opposite of pride, you know, it's humility. Like I said, pride is just this most stupidest, sinister thing in the world because all it is is a false worth. And since we're all evil, if we give ourselves a false worth, we're only going to make everybody's life around us miserable. So that's one of the things to really separate who we are and who Yahweh is, is to have humility to realize we're, nobody is any better than anybody else. People sometimes misinterpret judicial order. The fact that somebody may have a uh, more prestigious position or maybe more responsibility. But like I always say, a policeman, although we respect him and he has a great responsibility to protect us, it doesn't mean that he's better than you. It doesn't mean that his worth to Yahweh is more than you. 
No, it's just that he's in a position where he has more responsibility. So meekness is humility and gentleness. There's also a gentleness that when we deal with people, at times like we said, we may have to go to a brother or sister and correct them, but you want to do it always with gentleness. And the last one is self-control. Extremely important one. Because without self-control, you'll never do any of these other things. You'll never stick to them and stay to them. And self-control is temperance. It's control of one's will and their mind. You know, again, so this will stop you from compromising. It will stop you from falling into sins. You know, there's many times I've counseled with people that said, I, I can't overcome this. You know, I'm doing the same thing. You really got to pray for self-control. Temperance and control, one more. Taking every thought into captivity to the obedience of Messiah. So how do we do these? These are character traits of Yahweh and Yeshua. And if you want to be like them, you have to exhibit these. Because this is what Yahweh and Yeshua are. John 14 because you can do this. This is the exciting part. That in the world, they can't do it. Because they haven't repented, they haven't submitted to Yahweh. But Yeshua gives us a promise that we can do this in our life. That we can overcome ourselves. That we can change our nature. And we can become like Yahweh. John 14 and verse 10. Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words which I speak to you, I do not speak for myself, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if not, believe me because of the works' sake. Indeed, I tell you truly, the one believing into me, the works which I do, that one shall do also, and greater than these he will do, because I go to my Father. So very clearly we see again faith, that if you have that faith and you truly believe this, what does he say? And whatever you may ask in my name, this I will do, and the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Wow, that's a great, powerful promise. Drop down to verse 26. But the Redeemer, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything, and it will remind you of everything that I said to do. Verse 17, if we go back here. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see it nor know it, but you know it, for it dwells with you and shall be in you. We know each one of us that have been immersed in his name. We have that Holy Spirit living in us. So this is, this is the, the, the miracle. This is the mystery, the, the good news. You know, we're sitting here for 40 minutes talking about the fallen nature to get us in the right perspective. But now Yahweh is saying, you don't have to stay that way, though. That no, I'm not going to be like you. But you can be like me. You can be like me, but you have free will. You have to make that choice. You know, Yahweh puts before us life and death, and he'll never force us. He's not going to possess us the way Satan possesses, but he will gently guide and lead. And if we surrender, the human nature that we see has no good to us anyway. And in humility, you know, we clothe ourselves with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. We literally can be like him. You know, because there's only one spirit. And like he says in John 17, I and you and you and me and us and them. So the same spirit that makes Yahweh and Yeshua the same mind that makes them one and think the same way and united is living in us. And the only thing stopping us from being like them is us. That we're not submitting to it. You know, that we're allowing the deception in this world one way or another to stop us from being fully like him. And we are being like him in little ways, but we're, there's so much more potential that each of us can be doing. Matthew 10 and verse 32. Matthew 10 and verse 32. <clears throat> and that's what makes Passover such a great time of the year. Because it really, it, it, it magnifies the supremacy of Yeshua, the sacrifice that he did, not just to pay the penalty of our sins, but so that the Holy Spirit could live in us. That's what he said. Unless I go to the Father, the Comforter won't come. So it's not just a matter of your old fallen self being, you know, uh, replenished. It's like a plate that has a hole in it. Well, you could keep putting that water back in, but it's going to keep going out. But now you can get a new plate. Now you can get the hole fixed. Now you can get yourself that you can literally become a new person in Messiah. Uh, Matthew 10 and verse 32. That everyone who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. And don't think this is just someone coming up to you, 
you know, and say, do you deny Yeshua? Put a gun to your head. You know, curse Yeshua guy. Although that happens in the world today, it's happening more and more, especially in the East. But do you know, every day of our life, that we're not clothing ourselves with these nine fruits of the Spirit, and, and, and we're living to the fruits of the, 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 the flesh, we're denying Him, you know. When we attack our brother, we deny Him. You know, when we compromise in the Torah, we deny Him. Every single thing that we reject of this word, we're denying Him. And that's what He's saying. If you deny me, I'll deny you. Verse 34, Do not think I came to bring calm on the earth. I did not bring calm, but a sword. I came to divide a man against his father, and a daughter against a mother, and a bride against her mother-in-law. And the adversaries of a man will be those of his own house. So again, when we put our wife, or our daughter, or our parents, or our friends, or our boss at work, when we put anybody before Yeshua, we're denying him. We're denying him. And people do it all the time. You know? When we say, oh, I can't do this because I have to do this. And sometimes it's, it's a violation directly of the commandment. You know, well, my boss told me to do it. But remember, we have a bigger boss in heaven. So, whenever we make a decision, and we're putting a human before Yeshua or Yahweh's word, we're denying him. The one loving father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and the one loving son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his staff and follow after me is not worthy of me. The one finding his life will lose it, and the one losing his life on account of me shall find it. We deny Yeshua when we quench the Spirit by doing our own will. So this is something like he says, daily we have to take up the torture stick. Whatever it is in our personality that, that we're fighting. Because again, the fight isn't against somebody else, the fight is against ourselves. Because no one can take your free will. Even Satan. Sometimes people, oh that devil and oh this devil that, and everyone wants to blame Satan. And yeah, we have a lot to blame Satan for. But the one thing you can't blame Satan for is he doesn't have your free will. So when we make mistakes and we sin, you know, it's, it's us that made that decision. He may have tempted us, he may have tricked us, but only because we weren't surrendering to, to Yahweh. If we fully surrender to Yahweh, he would have no authority in our life. I've said it many times. Do you have anger? Do you have lust? Do you have greediness? These are all things that Satan owns. And if they're in your life, he's going to come and get them and you're going to be in trouble. But if your life is filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, he has no authority there. He has nothing to come from. The door will be locked. And the power from Yahweh will come. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. And this is the, this is the, the new believer in Messiah. This is the, the, the miracle that Yahweh gives us opportunity for. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed is the Elohim and Father of our Master Yeshua Messiah, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven through Messiah, even as he elected us in him before the foundation of the world, for us to be holy and without blemish before him in love, and he marked us with his love to be his from the beginning, and adopted us to be sons through Yeshua Messiah according to how it pleased his will. And if you go through Paul's epistles, and you look at these nine fruits, and you see how many times they're mentioned to believers, it's amazing, you know, because this is what we're doing. This is, like I said, once you have repented, and you have the Spirit living in you, and now you're surrendering to that Spirit daily, and you're letting the old person die, He'll build something new in you, and you're going to get these things. You're going to get them. To the praise of the glory of His grace, in which He poured upon us by His beloved one, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the remission of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He caused to abound toward us in all wisdom and understanding, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. And what's that mean? <coughs> Messiah in you, the hope of glory. That now, there is a difference between you and that person in the world. In the flesh, there is no difference. We both have the same nature, but in the spirit, there's a big difference. Because the spirit of Yahweh will allow us not to partake in those bad, evil things of the flesh that he said. Uh, let's drop down to... Verse 16, I also do not cease giving thanks on your behalf, making mention of you in my prayers, that the Elohim of our Master, Yeshua Messiah, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of Him. Exactly what we're talking about today. The eyes of your mind, having been enlightened 
for you to know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us, the ones believing according to the working of his mighty strength. And what is that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. That's the power. That's the power of the Spirit. Which he worked in Messiah in raising him from the dead, and he seated him at his own right hand in heaven. Far above the cherubs in authority and power and dominion, and every name having been named, not only in this age, but also in the coming age. He put all things under his feet and gave to him to be head over all things in the congregation, which is his body, the fullness of the one filling all things. So literally, Messiah is the head and we are part of that body. And when we glorify him and when we magnify his sacrifice, not only does it humble us you know, and gives him the proper glory, but then it enables us to, for his spirit to grow in us. But when we're all focusing on ourselves and on my dream and on this and making me up here instead of the Messiah, you know, maybe pulling in, like I said, self-righteousness, all we're doing is we're playing into the hands of Satan and we're only diminishing our own calling. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, another great chapter here about the same. Verse 3. We give thanks always to Yahweh the Father of our Master, Yeshua Messiah, and we always pray for you. Hearing of your faith in Messiah Yeshua and the love toward all the saints. Here it is again. Love is always the foundation. Love is always the basis that the people have. Because of the hope which is preserved for you in heaven, which you heard before in the word of the truth of the good news, which has been preached to you as also in all the world, and it is bearing fruit even also among you, from the day in which you heard and knew the grace of Elohim even truth. So again, if these nine things are abounding in your life, what will happen? You are going to bear fruit to Yahweh too. There's going to be fruit which he commands us to do. Even as you also learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow slave, who is a faithful minister of Messiah for you. He also showing to us your love in the Spirit. For this calls also from the day in which we heard, we do not cease praying on your behalf. And asking that you may be filled with the full knowledge of the will of Elohim and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Just like we said. Having those nine fruits. And what does he say? They never stop cease praying. That's another thing. The more we're praying for each other. The more we're praying for uh, each other to be filled with these gifts. The more our focus will be on being like Yahweh and not being like the world. That you may live a righteous life, pre pleasing to Elohim and bearing fruit in every good work and growing into the full knowledge of Elohim. Being empowered with all power, according to the might of his glory, to all patience and long-suffering and joy. Here he is. Get back to the nine fruits. So that you may joyfully, right, joy, the second fruit, give thanks to Yahweh the Father, who has enlightened and made us a worthy inheritance to the saints. And he has delivered us out of the authority of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Just like we talked about. Romans 3. We're all we're in that terrible state. But Yahweh doesn't want us to stay there. He wants us to come into this kingdom mentality. Where we're living with love, joy, peace, patience and all these things. And it's causing us to be like him and to bear fruit. In whom we have obtained salvation and the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible Elohim. The right of the firstborn of all creations. For all things were created through him, including ourselves, the things in the heaven and the things on the earth, the visible and invisible, whether imperial thrones or dominions or angelic orders or authorities, all things were in his hand and have been created by him. And he is before all things, and by him all things are sustained. He is the supremacy of all. And he is the head of the body, the congregation, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the resurrection of the dead, that he be preeminent in all things. Praise Yahweh. Because it pleased Elohim to complete all things in him. And through him making peace, you know, another one of the nine gifts, by the blood of his crucifixion to reconcile all things to himself, through him, whether the things on earth or the things in heaven. And you then being alienated and hostile in your minds, right? So everything gets back to your mind. That's what Yahweh and Satan are fighting against. The free will of your mind. And you then being alienated and hostile in your minds by evil works. But now peace has been given. Through the sacrifice of his body and his death, that he may raise you before him holy and without blemish and blameless. If indeed you continue in the faith grounded, faith, another one of them, and settled and not be moved away from the hope of the good news which you have heard and which has been preached in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. 
And now rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf, and fill in my flesh the things lacking of the afflictions of Messiah on behalf of his body, which is the congregation, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of Elohim given to me to preach the word of Elohim everywhere. Even the mystery having been hidden from the ages and from the generations, but now is revealed to his saints, to whom Yahweh will to make known that what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the nations, which is Messiah in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. The mystery is where before we were tortured by our fallen human nature, and there was no answer. But now, now if we surrender that nature, which we all should do gladly and give it up to Yahweh, that he can put a new nature in us, that his spirit can grow, that all of a sudden you have all these things in your life because the spirit of Yahweh is growing in you. Him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may cause every man to become perfect in Yeshua Messiah. And to this end I also labor, struggling according to the working of him who works in me in power. So even the Apostle Paul was struggling. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's some magical pill, the opposite. It is a struggle and a fight for your life but you have to be aware of it and you have to do it every day of your life. You can't give in to the fruits of the flesh. You can't give in to anger, to envy, to gossip. You can't give in to, 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 uh, to lust, to covetedness. You can't give in to those things. You have to fight it tooth and nail. And your spirit, remember, the spirit in you is greater than the spirit in the world. That's all the spirit of the world. You have a spirit that can quash all that. But you have to fight it. You have to fight it. And you have to allow these nine fruits of the Spirit to grow in your life. And then that's the miracle. That's your greatest testimony is you. That there's the old you that was a burned out hunk of junk that's, that's worthless. That you said, let Yahweh take, but now there's a new you. There's a new you that's a different person because it's not you. It's Messiah in you, the hope of the Lord. So we don't have to sit here saying, you know how great I am? And you know what I did? No, it's what Messiah did in me. It's what Yahweh did. And that's why he says, where's the boasting? Because there's one spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit that's bringing us to this truth. Uh, a couple of quick scriptures, and we'll end. Psalm 15. Psalm 15, because this is the person that will be in the kingdom of Yahweh. This is the person, if you want to be like Yahweh, this is the person you want to become. A Psalm of David. Oh, Yahweh, who shall sojourn in your tabernacle? Right? Tabernacle David just found. Who shall settle on your holy mountain? He who walks uprightly and walks righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his friend, nor lifts a reproach against his neighbor. In his eyes, the reprobate has been despised. You know, we don't want to bring the sinner in. We want him to repent, but we don't want to accept those bad actions. But he honors those who fear Yahweh. You know, without, if someone doesn't have the fear of Yahweh, run in the other direction, because that person will be a misery in your life. In his eyes, the reprobate has been despised, but he honors those who fear Yahweh. He has sworn to his hurt, and he will not change it. You know, what comes out of our mouth? Even if it's going to, it's not, oh, you know, I know I said I'm going to hell, but, no, it comes out of your mouth, you have to perform it. This is the person who will dwell in the tabernacle of Yahweh. He has not given a silver interest, nor has taken a bribe against the innocent. He does, he who does these things shall not be shaken forever. So this is, if we want to be like Yahweh, this is the person we have to strive for. And the last scripture is Matthew 5, 48. Because like I said, it doesn't happen all automatically. It's not a magic pill we take. It's a lifelong journey of picking up our torture stick every day and surrendering to Yahweh. Matthew 5, 48. Therefore you become perfect or complete even as your Father in Heaven is perfect. And this is why it's so dangerous the Laodicean, who thinks he's rich and increased with goods in need of nothing, because he separated himself from the body of Messiah. He doesn't need anybody. Because he's very rich, he can do what he wants, he travel over here, I'm going to go to Hawaii for the feast and have a great time. And he thinks in his mind that he's like Yahweh. And yet, like we read in Psalm 50, Yahweh says, no, I'm not like you. If you're separated from my body, if you don't want to follow the leadership that I put in place, if you don't want to serve my people, if you don't want to have humility and love one another, then you have to surrender yourself to, to love one another. Yahweh says, no, I'm not like you. I'm not like you. We must become like Yahweh to be in the kingdom. We have to surrender our fallen nature. 
the nature to his nature of the nine fruits of the Spirit through the Ruach HaKodesh. It will not just happen, like I said, you have to fight yourself every day of your life, every day reading his word daily, praying without ceasing, asking Yahweh for guidance in all things, fasting often, and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. Take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Messiah. Think before speaking to give the Holy Spirit a chance to speak through us. Listen to that small, still voice of Yahweh and deny yourself because, no, Yahweh is not like you, but you can be like Yahweh. Yahweh bless.